I too would like to thank uh, Peter and Chris for the opportunity to present this work and uh, also for the help from the ITAC team for putting this uh, meeting together. Uh, so this morning I'm going to talk about um, some quite recent work that's become from the Nistine Storage Group concerned with um, quantum information processing and quantum simulation. We're going to look at um, a new type of implementation of a gate, a different method for um, entanglement production, and also some experiments that relate to quantum simulation. Uh, so there are three topics, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, in this particular talk, but there's some other stuff going on in the Nistine Storage Group uh, that we're going to be talking about at the topical group discussion. Uh, so David Alcock's going to be talking about our microwave gate work and the hot topic of anomalous heating. Um, and I'm going to be covering some, covering some of the other uh, topics uh, that the group's been doing recently, particularly relating to scalability. So let's look at the first, um, first of three topics here. So it's a new type of phase gate. Uh, so in this particular uh, implementation, it's a proposal uh, by Bermudas and colleagues recently for an entangling phase gate. Uh, it involves applying um, a carrier um, spin flip, so flips the spin doesn't change the motion, as well as a single spin motion sideband. And you can either choose to use um, something that adds, adds motion or subtracts motion. Uh, in the implementation that we have of this particular gate, we can choose to use either lasers or microwaves to implement um, the, uh, the carrier spin flip, and in principle one could use both for doing the sideband as well. So as I mentioned, then the idea really here is that you, you apply a very strong carrier pulse at the same time as a single sideband. And this essentially gives you a type of molmer sorensen type gate where the, where the, um, the strong carrier is essentially uh, flipping you from motion adding and motion subtracting in time. So in the molmer sorensen type gate, one would apply both motion subtracting and motion uh, adding simultaneously. In this case, you don't need to do this. You just apply one, and then the carrier does, uh, does the, uh, gives you effectively that process. It's an address state basis, of course, because we're, we're applying a strong carrier that dresses. Uh, so we are interested, or we're interested, in, in this particular scheme because it, induce, it, it's, it is a less technical overhead. We can apply, as I said, the carrier using the microwaves, and now we're only applying a single sideband, so we only have to calibrate the frequency for that single one, not both of them. Um, and one also gets some built-in dynamical decoupling, so hopefully we should get a, an improved fidelity. So for the particular experiment that I'm going to describe, uh, what we did was we investigated the scheme by measuring the fidelity of generating a particular bell state. Um, and this work's now been published and it's uh, available here in PRL. So the, in the experimental scheme, we have uh, two beryllium ions that are trapped in a um, microfabricated um, linear pull trap. Uh, we can apply the carrier, as I said, uh, carrier transitions by applying microwaves, or we could use lasers. Um, we apply Raman laser beams for, for stimulated Raman transitions. The, the qubit states that we're, we're using here are two ground state, hyperfine states of beryllium, uh, and they're separated by 1.2 gigahertz, so this is in the microwave regime. So we can go from here to here with a microwave transition, and we can go uh, do it, in this case I've drawn a motion subtracting sideband transition going from here to here. And then there's a small amount of detuning as well, which is on a scale of kilohertz. So and in this arrangement, um, we have the, uh, the ions are coupled, and we have two modes, a center of mass mode and a stretch mode. And so in this uh, particular experiment, we're doing a, a stretch, looking at the stretch mode at 4.5 megahertz. And so uh, to complete the experiment, what we do is we doppler cool the ions and then cool them both to the, to the ground state using sideband um, transitions. Uh, and then we apply this interaction, this, this combination of a carrier and the sideband at the same time and for some duration. And then after that duration, we measure the population. So this is measuring the populations of spin up and spin up. Um, it's been down and down, and then populations where, where we've got one up, one down. So this is basically, in, in for our particular states that we're looking at, then this is two measuring two bright ions, two dark ions, in a situation where one of the ions is bright. And so you can see the populations evolving here. So we start in this particular um, up-up state, 
And with time, uh, what we find is that the population up up comes down, down down comes up, and at this point here we have an equal population or roughly equal population of spin up and spin down and a minimum in the, in the population for, for the one ions bright. Uh, if we want to actually, so this is the populations, if we want to extract the fidelity then, then we need to be able to measure the off diagonal elements of the, um, of the density matrix and for that we perform a parity experiment. And so here's the parity data and we can fit to this parity data and for if we use a laser carrier for doing the, uh, the carrier drive then uh, we get a fidelity of, of about 95%. Uh, and if we use a microwave carrier, then it's a little bit better. And so the, the issue here is that um, for the laser carrier here, then, then we, we have enhanced spontaneous emission that's occurring. So that's the dominant issue in, uh, for this um, laser carrier implementation of the setup. For the microwave, of course, that's a little less uh, Raman laser light on, so the, the, uh, the performance is a little bit better. Uh, in both of these experiments, anomalous heating plays a significant role. So we've got at least a 1% error in the, um, uh, in the fidelity associated with anomalous heating. In this particular case, the ions are not super close to the surface of the trap, about 100 microns, but still close enough. We also have some, uh, some state preparation detection issues. If we do a simulation of the experiment, then the simulation is the solid line here, and you can see that it agrees pretty nicely with what, with what we're seeing. Um, so this particular value of the, of the fidelity here, this value here is actually um, uh, uh, quite high for the particular uh, qubit states that we use at NIST. Um, as well as doing this, um, ex this kind of gate in a room temperature setup, which is what we talked about before, uh, we decided that we would try and implement this on a surface trap. Um, there some, were some concerns that perhaps we might run into other, other issues when we have ions close to the surface on a surface trap. Um, so we, we basically we've taken the same, exactly the same um, entangling system here. We, we have a, a trap that was developed by Kent and Brown. It's a cryogenically cooled trap. Um, this shows the design of the, of the particular trap. So there's an R, RF, it's a linear pull trap, RF electrodes here and here. Um, a DC electrode here, and we can also uh, apply a microwave uh, current along that particular line. There are a bunch of different DC electrodes along here because this is a multi-zone trap, so we don't have to, to trap uh, ions in, in a single well, and in fact I'll show you a double well uh, trap experiment soon. Uh, and so uh, this, this, the, this shows the, the design, as I said, it's a slightly different implementation of this trap than, than was done in Kenton's, but uh, for this picture, it looks kind of the same. So in this in this situation, we've got ions that are um, 40 uh, that are uh, in in a four megahertz single uh, potential well here. It's cryogenically cooled, as I mentioned before, and so the heating rate is is quite low in this particular implementation, only 100 to 200 quanta per second, which is for ions that are 40 microns off the surface of the trap. So they're quite close to the surface, and yet we're getting a heating rate which is comparable with what one would see in the, in the other experiment I just talked about. So when we, um, are trying, when we perform the gate uh, in, in this particular configuration uh, and measure the parity, so here's some parity data, um, then in this arrangement we're getting a fidelity of about 94%. So this is um, an implementation, let's say a preliminary implementation of this particular experiment. Uh, we optimized uh, the fidelity for what we could do with this particular arrangement, but um, there are some limitations to what, 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 what we did in this particular arrangement. So um, for example, the, the, the Raman transitions that we applied in this particular configuration were, let's say, our standard uh, sideband type transitions. And so they aren't very large, there's not a larger tuning for those uh, transitions and so one has a significant amount of spontaneous emission. So about 4% of this f fidelity, based on our simulations, we estimate about 4% is associated with spontaneous emission. Um, one could uh, increase the detuning and, 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 and therefore you would need to increase the laser power to accommodate that particular situation. We haven't fully investigated that particular situation uh, yet. Um, one of the challenges with surface traps is that if you just increase the, the laser power, then you have to be very careful that you're not charging um, particles, dielectric on the surface that then shifts 
the trapping frequency and then pushes our Raman transitions, our sideband transitions of cooling off resonance. And so this is one of the uh, technical issues, I guess, in the, in the lab that we have to deal with. Also, we have a significant amount of um, uh, intensity noise associated with, with um, laser beam pointing. I'm going to talk a little bit about, on, uh, on Friday, some of the methods that we're using to deal with some of these issues. So this is um, preliminary data, and we, we're probably going to go back to have a look at this experiment and see whether we can push this fidelity a little harder. Um, but uh, now what I want to do is, is switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of these, how some of these ideas might relate to, um, to quantum simulation, and in particular our implementation of what we would call a, a building block for a quantum simulation type of experiments. Um, so uh, when we think about trying to perform uh, quantum information experiments in some kind of scalable way, then we, we imagine some, some large, let's say, microfabricated uh, trap configuration where we have many electrodes. We're able to focus laser beams on certain um, uh, pairs of atoms to perform gate operations. We're able to actually shuttle ions around. And, uh, and in this situation, what we're doing to, to get, bring ions together to perform these operations is that we, we might have ions in a common trapping potential, separate those ions out, shuttle some of them, combine them into trapping potentials, perform the gate operations. These are the kinds of ideas um, that, that spring to mind when you think about this kind of picture. Um, but if, you, uh, if we're really serious about scalability uh, for quantum information processing, um, then it's hard to imagine not being able to, um, it's hard to imagine a situation where we're not at some point going to require transfer of quantum information when we have ions in, in separate trapping areas or in remote areas. And of course one implementation of, of such a thing is, is in Chris Munro's group where, they, where there's a large separation between the two ions, in this case a meter, and, and photons are used to transfer the quantum information between these two ions. And one could imagine that this, um, this kind of arrangement might be very important uh, when you have um, a distributed quantum computer or quantum simulator where the, the, the node spacing in, in this uh, network, let's say, is, is quite large. But, but what about trying to do a similar kind of thing with Coulomb interaction in, a, in an arrangement which is perhaps not so dissimilar to this? Uh, well, we've been um, thinking about how one might uh, ar arrange the Coulomb coupling, but of course people, many people have been thinking about structures, two-dimensional structures uh, for performing uh, quantum simulation experiments. And so here's a number of, of uh, uh, just some examples of, of, of work that people have done on trying to, to think about how one might implement these kind of structures. So in the end what I'm talking about is some kind of lattice arrangement. We might have individual addressability in some part of that, but it, what we want is we want Coulomb coupling between the different, um, be between the different ions in, the, in this lattice structure. So, of course, we're quite some way away from this kind of thing, but we're working towards this. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what you need in this situation is, cool, is uh, uh, this uh, phonon coupling that b between the, the different particles in your lattice arrangement, and so the first step for doing that has been uh, achieved already, both uh, at, at NIST by us and also by Rainer Blatt's group. And so here's uh, um, some uh, plots that were shown that come from, from, from that work. So uh, Kenton Brown's setup is, sh is shown along here. And what these plots are actually doing is, that, is showing is the, the emotional exchange, the energy exchange that, that one, one can uh, produce when you have, so in this particular example, for, then, then the ions are, are uh, cooled to the ground state and then uh, one phonon is uh, placed in one of those ions and then uh, we just watch that energy exchange backwards and forwards. And so you can see this, this uh, flopping that's occurring and a similar kind of result. Um, at, at the Innsbruck group. So this is the first step towards doing it. You need this to show nice Coulomb coupling. Both of these done in surface traps. Um, so now let me tell you a little more detail about the particular experiment that we did at NIST because um, I'm going to extend this particular experiment to, to talk about 
um, sim our simulation work. So in Kenton's arrangement, what he did was he had two irons in, in the strap. As I said, there's a bunch of different DC electrodes in here, so you can, you can generate uh, double well potentials with a, a range of different spacings. In this particular arrangement, the ions were 40 microns apart. And the, the rate at which this energy is exchanged um, is given by this expression. And, and I just want to draw your attention to this D here, which is the spacing between these two ions. So it's critically, the rate that you can couple, the, the, the phonons can couple backwards and forwards, is critically dependent on the spacing D. So in Kenton's particular situation, the time frame for, or the period of this oscillation is around 200, um, 200 microseconds. And one of the limitations or one of the challenges with trying to do this particular experiment, because in this one what, he's, what Kenton did was to cool all the way down to the ground state or very near to the, to the ground state and then look at the flopping backwards and forwards of a single phonon. And so uh, one of the challenges with trying to do this is that for this particular implementation, there was a, uh, by cryogenic standards, quite a significant amount of background heating going on and that's washing out this particular um, particular oscillation. As well as that, one also has to have for this, for this to work, what you're essentially doing is you're having this trapping potential and this trapping potential, you're individually controlling those trapping, the different wells in here by making adjustments to these DC electrodes and you have to do it in a way so that this frequency and that frequency remain the same. Okay, so it has to stay nice and stable over this kind of time frame, which is getting up to a millisecond. So that's another challenge. So it's this ion separation is the thing which really makes the difference. And so more recently we've made some improvements to this arrangement. Um, so what we did was design a different um, trapping potential, which now pushes the ions uh, closer together. So now we have a spacing of 30 microns on, a, on ions that are 40 microns off the surface. So it's starting to become a bit of a challenge to do that. Um, we now also have a different implementation of, the, of this particular trap, so a different fabrication run, a different preparation of the trap going into the cryostat. And so instead of having a heating rate of about 1800 quanta per second, we're now down to 100 quanta per second. And this particular number is really important because it's basically telling us on the time frame that we want to see exchange going backwards and forwards between these, um, the two ions and the two separate wells that the absorption of a quanta is now somewhat small compared with that rate. So now this particular heating rate is not a limiting factor in, in, uh, in trying to, say, perform entanglement between two ions in, in, in these separate wells. So we would like to, of course, make this a lot lower, but even at 100, we're in pretty good shape. Um, some other things that we've done is we've improved the trap stability and the control. So some of these things are just uh, things that um, involve, for example, maintaining uh, nice clean electrodes on the surface uh, so that we don't charge up when we're shining laser beams which shift the frequency and changing some electronics about how we control. So before what we had was something where we were able to see this and now we're able to see this. So um, as I said, the, the time frame that you get is it um, depends critically on the spacing. So even a relatively small change in the separation makes a huge difference to that exchange rate. And so this is showing the, the flopping. This, this decay or this loss of contrast is because the, the two wells are not staying in motion or resonance during the time frame that we're, we're um, well, they're drifting out a little bit of out of resonance. To do this plot is 20,000, repeat of 20,000 experiments, it takes a few minutes to do. And so that's why we're seeing this contrast. So let's think of, look, look at another way of how well can we control our system. So we can, we've got a coupled harmonic oscillator and so what we, can, we can map out the avoided crossing. And so that's what this plot showing. So, so we're using um, Raman sideband transitions to measure the, the trap frequencies, the confinement in both of those two wells. Uh, and what we're doing along this axis is tuning the potentials in each, the, the curvatures in each of the potentials individually to, to bring um, those uh, two potentials, uh, the, the ions and the two potentials onto resonance. So out here then, basically the two ions are not coupled, their trapping frequencies are independent or their motion is independent. Once we start getting into this regime here, they become very strongly coupled. So the frequency splitting in this particular arrangement uh, is up to about 12 kilohertz now. 
Um, so you can see from this plot that we have pretty nice control over that avoided crossing. So the emotional coupling is at least in this setup quite nicely under control. Okay, so now the question is can we actually, you know, what might we be able to do with, with a system like this? Well, in our particular experiment, we've got two brilliant minds. We're using, as I said before, these hyperfine, hyperfine states as our qubits, and so this represents a pseudo spin half system. Uh, to study what, how well we can actually um, to study a particular interaction, we chose to stick with this Bermuda style um, gate uh, process. So the, the, the experiment I'm going to show you involves applying a strong carrier with a microwave in this case, um, as well as an off-resonant um, red sideband transition. And, and these things are applied homogeneously to both ions. In the case of these coupled ions, then the, the, the two, the, um, the normal modes of motion of the two ions, the center of mass and the stretch, are very close together. As I said in the previous slide, they're like 12 kilohertz apart. So we're actually going to tune our sideband, um, our strong, our, sorry, our red sideband interaction midway between these motional modes. And so we're getting coupling to both modes at the same time. Um, so for this particular interaction, then we, we have, an, an, for this particular setup, then we're, we're basically generating an, an antiferrometric in, interaction. And because we have control over the individual potential wells, then in principle one can actually tune the strength of this, um, of this interaction. So to test how well this system might work, then we, we're performing experiments where we, we try and generate this particular bell stain. So for, um, for this particular experiment, the time that it takes to implement this, for, for this um, state to be created, depends on the Rabi frequency for the Raman um, sideband transition and also this exchange. So you can see that this exchange time really sets the time frame over which the gate is, or, or which this interaction is going to happen. Uh, so here, uh, this is a plot that performs a similar experiment to what we did with the, the dressed phase gate before. So we're measuring populations. Um, so this is the population of two bright ions, both in the down state, P2. The green is um, one ion bright, so it could be spin up, spin down, or, or the other way around. Um, and, and then um, uh, both in the, um, uh, in the up, up state. And so you can see that we're actually getting behavior which is pretty similar to the dressed state phase gate with the two ions in the room temperature well. This population's coming down, this one's climbing, um, this, this blue one's climbing up, and around this particular position here, we have a minimum in the uh, one iron bright situation and we're approximating this particular state. This, the, to work out how well this is working to calculate the fidelity, we need to, to know some things about the populations, so in particular the even populations. So the even populations, the total population of these, these, these two, the P2 and P0 in this particular situation is just over 90%. But what about the fidelity for the fidelity for the off diagonal? Uh, components, then we have to also um, do what we, I talked about before for the um, for the dress state phase gate. We have to apply a pi upon two um, uh, uh, an analysis pulse and vary the phase. This um, result, I'm putting preliminary here. We we haven't quite finished all of the analysis that uh, that we want to do on these populations, um, but I think it's pretty close. Okay, so here's the, the parity. Um, so from the parity curve, we get an amplitude of about 73%. The combination of these two, two numbers means that we uh, can produce a fidelity for this particular interaction of about 82%. So this compared with into the, into the mid to high 90s for when you've got two ions in, the, um, in, a, in a single well. So we're able to do the entanglement between these ions that are 30 microns apart. Again, this is a preliminary result. These numbers might change by a small amount, so, so don't, don't quote me on this exact number. I, th I think if there's any variation, it's going to be on the scale of less than a percent, but, but that's, um, that's kind of where we are now. Okay, so um, finally the last topic that I want to talk about is, is a, a different method. I guess it's a topic that's been talked about already in this meeting, a dissipative um, production of entanglement. Uh, so. Uh, in this experiment uh, was a collaboration with, with uh, the theoreticians and Anders Soren and Florentin Rita at the Niels Bohr Institute. So typically what one would do for, for deterministic entanglement is use quantum gates. That's mostly what we do. But of course this is the, the proposal uh, 
Uh, the, the scheme that we're working on here is an alternative approach, so we're trying to engineer the dissipation that we've got to stabilize, to produce and then stabilize some particular, um, particular in, entangled state. Uh, in this particular uh, implementation that we've got, we, I'm going to describe, um, there are some nice features of that. For example, it's independent of the initial state that we start with. It's time independent because the interactions that we apply, we apply continuously. And in principle, this scheme could be just as powerful as um, performing quantum information processes with unitary gates. Okay, so let me describe the system. It's a four-level system, a little complicated, so I'll step through it. Um, so we have our, in this system, we're using two ground state hyperfine, um, hyperfine states as our qubits, our up and down qubits. It's two beryllium ions that we are using in this particular state. In addition to this, we have an auxiliary state, hyperfine state that we want to use. Uh, and we, we also have a fast decaying excited state. And, and the state that we're trying to produce in the end in steady state is this particular state, the singlet state for this basis. Uh, of course, the ions are trapped uh, in, in this trap, which I mentioned before, this uh, microfabricated trap here. And so we not only have the electronic states to deal with, but we also have the emotional states, so this ground state, first excited state. Uh, in addition, in this, in this implementation of the experiment, there are two beryllium ions, which are our qubit ions, but we also have cooling, so one, a dissipation process sympathetic cooling, and in this case it's done by, by having four ions in the chain. And the two other ions are magnesium ions, and we do ground state cooling on those magnesium ions, and they sympathetically cool the beryllium ions. Um, so, so we have this rate kappa for uh, sympathetically cooling the beryllium uh, if it's in this n equal 1 state down to, back down to the ground state. And then we apply um, a strong sideband transition. Um, so um, in this, in this interact, so the sideband transition is between our, 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 qubit, our qubit states, and in this case it's a blue sideband transition. This omega s is the, the Rabi frequency for, this, for the, for the, inter, for the inter sideband transition. And then uh, the, this one and the two refers to the two ions, and this is the Fox state creation um, operator. So now we have strong sideband transition connecting these two together as well as the sympathetic cooling at the same time. And so um, what does that actually do to the system? Um, so there are, in this particular system, there are two dark states of this, of this Hamiltonian. Uh, the state that we actually want, the singlet state here, as well as this particular state. And then there are two other remaining basis states and so, and they're not dark. So what happens to those particular states? It turns out that they're effectively pumped from, from, from here. These two states are effectively pumped into this state. And so remember what we're trying to do is produce this in the end. So at the moment now, if we leave this interaction, the combination of this and this on for some period of time, we're down to two states because these other ones that are not dark are slowly pumped into this state. How do we deal with that? Uh, we, we then use this auxiliary state that I mentioned before. We apply a carrier transition, so no spin changing, uh, no motion changing here. It's a microwave transition that we use. It's weak compared with this particular transition. And so, um, so and, uh, what does that actually do? So uh, remember the state that we have to deal with, we're trying to generate is this one. As if we, when we applied the sideband as well as the sympathetic cooling, then we also generated this state. When we turn on the carrier at the same time, then the carrier couples spin up to this auxiliary state A, and so we end up with uh, the, the carrier coupling this state to a combination of these particular ones. It also, the carrier, you might think, would also couple from this S state that we want to, to, some, to another state involving uh, this auxiliary state, and this would be bad. But it turns out that, that when we apply a strong sideband transition, then we get an optical Stark shift. Um, so, so this transition is actually shifted off resonance. So uh, popula population in here, once it's in here, doesn't get transferred to here. Um, and so, so we're suppressing this particular situation. It relies on the fact that our, our sideband transition is strong compared with the carrier. Um, what about the other states? Um, all of these other states are dark. 
to the sideband uh, dark states for, for, for HS. And so they're, they're, these ones, are the transitions from here to here are, are not stark shift out of, out, of, um, out of resonance. So we have to deal with those as well. And so finally what we do is we then have to add a repumper. So we add this transition in here. We get spontaneous emission rapidly from this fast decaying excited state that pushes the population back into our, our qubit manifold along here. So you can see it's a kind of a, it's a complicated process in the end with these three different drives, sympathetic cooling as well, spontaneous emission. And all of these things are driven homogeneously and simultaneously on the system. So in, in the qubit basis state, let's have a little more of a think about, about what's going on here. So what we're trying to do is generate this particular state. When we have the carrier and repumping going on at the same particular time, that can drive population from this state, either up this way or this way. Um, but when we add a strong sideband, as well as the sympathetic cooling, then this pumps us from this triplet state uh, up to here, and from here it can go up to here. We also have some, some off-resonant processes that depump us out of the state. So, so we have um, the carrier and the repumping combination can push us from the state that we want back down to here. It can take us all the way down to the triplet state or back down to here. But these processes are, are off-resonant. And because they're off-resonant, then essentially the, the rate at which we pump into the state is larger than the rate at which we push population out. And we eventually end up in this particular state to some extent. So it relies, uh, in order for this sort of pumping scheme to work, remember you need a strong sideband transition compared with the rate for the carrier, sympathetic cooling, and spontaneous emission. So that's the state we're trying to do. So uh, let's look at some experimental results. So in this um, situation, then we're doing Doppler cooling on our, our cooling ions. We're doing sideband cooling to the ground state on our coolant ions. And then we're applying all of these interactions and waiting. So we start in this. So, so the different colors represent uh, down, down, up, up, the triplet and the singlet. The, trip, the singlet is the, one, is the state that we're trying to, to produce in the end. So we start in the down-down state, for the, that's just the preparation that we did for this particular experiment, and then wait for some period of time. And you can see that the singlet state population starts to grow um, over, over a time scale on the order of a few milliseconds. And in the end, it settles to some value up here, which corresponds, um, uh, if, if one calculates the, the fidelity with which uh, this, this state is created, it turns out that that fidelity just corresponds to its population, uh, and its population is, is 75%. So we're generating uh, the particular state that we want with a fidelity of about 75%. You can see that this, this um, data perhaps on this side is a little bit lower than maybe it is on this side. So you might say, well, gee, it's how steady actually is it? This is uh, what's going on, on on this side here is that we're actually getting some coupling to, to other spin states that are outside of the manifold. And so there's a slight reduction. But the time frame for that to occur is very long compared with this, or quite long at least. And so that's why we, would, we, we make the claim that this is really a steady state production of this particular state. Um, there's similar work being done in, this, in superconducting systems uh, at Yale. And so I've put the reference down here. So this is an arrangement which I described before where it's a continuous drive. Everything's running at the same time. It's independent of that initial state. But we can also actually implement it in a stepwise arrangement by taking advantage of a few coherence of coherences that occur in the system. So if you're careful about when you turn uh, the drives on and off, then, then you can take advantage of the fact that the populations are oscillating due to coherences and speed the process up. So in this arrangement, what we're doing is breaking it the, the, um, the process into uh, periods of time where we're applying the, the um, where we're applying the, the, the sideband and, and the um, carrier, and other times where we're applying the repumper and so forth. And then um, for this particular arrangement, as I said, because it's taking advantage of some, of some coherences, then the process is a little faster than it is in the previous arrangement. And because it's a little faster, then the fidelity is a little better. And the reason for that is because the limit to what's going on here or to this fidelity, it's dominated by spontaneous emission. So what you want to do is eliminate, uh, lessen the amount of time that you have the Raman laser light on. And for this arrangement, it's about half the time. 
So, so the, 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 the side band transition uh, drive is on for about uh, roughly half the time. So it, it, wor it works a little bit better. And so um, that's pretty much the three topics that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, so I, I put a picture up here of, the, of a particular group. So for the, um, you can see there's quite a lot of us, but the two graduate students that were involved in the dissipative cooling uh, entanglement stuff and the, and the phase gate. So this is Ting, Ting Ray Tan, he, he, he and John Gabler, the postdoc who works on this group, who John managed to escape this uh, photo in the, from the group. But uh, th these guys led the work on the phase gate. Uh, Yi Hing um, Lin is the graduate student who worked with John and others in, in that group uh, to do the dissipative uh, entanglement work. And of course, uh, all of the work that I've presented today was led by Dee Dee and, uh, and Dave. And so with that, I shall stop. Um, imagine that. Ike. Ike. <laughs> <laughs> In the Yale work which you cited, they described the very analogous process uh, to what you have, where they say that the first step, uh, analogous to your um, um, sideband plus um, sympathetic cooling, is a um, projection. And then the second step is a measurement with feedback. Is that a fair description of what you're doing as well? I don't know. <coughs> I have to think about it. I think they, I think they, I, and I don't, and I can't really speak for them, but I think they, they, they would argue it, it's right. continuous. They, they get better results when they have separate feedback, but I, I think it's pretty much the same thing. Looks like everybody's ready for lunch. So yep. let's thank everybody <laughs> from the morning session.